Who among you does not relish the experience of exploring the wonderful worlds of these great games? Reveal yourself, he or she, whose pulse does not quicken at the sight of the pale lunar splendour of Erythil of the Boreal Valley, the wide golden vistas of Altus Plateau, or the flying, flying buttresses of Anorlondo Castle. My god. As fans of the Souls games, Bloodborne, Sekiro and Elden Ring, if indeed you are a fan, we love moving through these worlds and their dense and flavourful levels, filled to the brim with enemies, items and bosses. But these worlds are also near overwhelmingly hostile in nature, sometimes oppressively so, and things can even get a wee bit lonely when you're out in some remote dungeon, swamp or forest. Which is why it can feel so damn nice when you come across a friendly face in some broken, barren place. From Demon Souls all the way to Elden Ring, various NPCs can be found scattered around in various ways. Some are there as merchants, and some as blacksmiths. Some have long, intricate questlines, and some are simply there to provide an occasional nugget of exposition and flavour. Some are right there from the start, whereas others must be sought out and rescued before they may become steadfast allies or perhaps deadly enemies. There are loads of brilliant characters from these games with great personalities and or questlines, and as such, I thought it would make for a fun video for me to list my absolute favourites from each of these seven games, as well as a runner-up mention from each game too. I'd originally intended to do a best and worst NPCs video, just as I've already done for bosses, levels, enemies and mini-bosses, but to be honest I couldn't really think of any NPCs I genuinely thought were poor. Sure, there are evil ones like Mephistopheles from Demon Souls and Royal Sorcerer Navlan from Dark Souls 2, but they're not bad characters, they're just evil. And so let's just stay positive and talk about the creme de la creme. If you enjoy the video, hey, why not subscribe to the channel? I make fun videos about great games. And please allow me to give a massive thanks to my brilliant patrons for supporting the channel. And with that being said, let's kick off the list with Demon's Souls. Not only did Demon's Souls kick off FromSoft's signature style of combat and level design and introduce several gameplay mechanics which still appear in their games even today, but it also gave us a plethora of interesting and memorable characters to meet, rescue and even kill. To be honest, if you compare the way NPCs were utilised in Demon's Souls to the way they'd go on to feature in Elden Ring 13 whole years later, other than scale and perhaps questline complexity, very little has really changed in the way they're handled, for better or for worse, depending on how much you might personally feel inclined to engage with these quests, if at all. There are already a damn crowd of characters present in the Nexus when you first get there, ranging from your acolytes of the Soul Arts and Disciples of God situated along the wings, to your crestfallen warrior by the Boletaria Archstone, to the dark and mysterious Candle Maiden, and to Stockpile Thomas and Blacksmith Ed, here to lighten your load and sharpen your steel. Both of whom have Scottish accents, by the way. Nice. Her Candle Maiden cared for me during my first days here. She says very little, but has a kind heart. She's just the age my young daughter would have been. And if you're worried that I might be a wee bit biased towards characters with Scottish accents, rest assured that, yes, I am. I'm kidding, of course, but for whatever reason, about half of the characters in Demon's Souls are Scottish. Compared to the Dark Souls trilogy and Bloodborne, where nearly everybody sounds English, Sekiro, where everyone sounds American, or, you know, Japanese, or Elden Ring where tons of the characters are Welsh. Surely the Irish are going to get their turn soon. Well, there's always Ladersmith Gilligan, I guess. Despite how lively the Nexus already is from the get-go, you can populate it with a bunch more characters, usually after rescuing them from some perilous situation in some frightful level, like how we free Saint Urbane from a gloomy cave in the Shrine of Storms after slaying the Black Phantom there, or how we save Ostrava from hordes of soul-starved dreglings, after which they'll migrate, sometimes only briefly, over to the Nexus for some chatter, and perhaps to peddle their wares. My pick for best NPC in Demon's Souls, though, goes to Bior of the Twin Fangs. We first hear Bior's name spoken in the intro sequence after creating our character, with him being one of the few heroes bold enough to have ventured through the thick, 
colourless fog obscuring the fallen kingdom of Boataria, along with other figures who we also meet in the world, like Yurt, the Silent Chief, Saint Estraya, and Sage Frake. Compared to those characters though, Bior is a wee bit easier to miss. In fact, I believe I totally missed him on my first few playthroughs of Demon Souls back in the day. First he must be freed, requiring the defeat of a certain fat official in the inner ward who drops the iron keyring which can then be used to open up a locked area at the end of the ward's path, with Bior himself being held captive there by another fat official, not unlike how Yuri the Witch is also held in Boataria. Bior's cell can be opened with the bloody iron key dropped by the official here, though far from him being reduced to some sullen, weakened shell of a man as a result of his captivity, he's instantly bursting with personality, even teaching us a new insult. Who goes there? Ah, you killed that blooded sluggard for me. I'm called Bior, the elder of the twin fangs of Boletaria. I thank you. You deserve a handsome reward. And I have none. <laughs> Though he follows it up by immediately falling asleep in the very cell we just freed him from. Not quite the grand escape I had in mind for you, Bior. Regardless, you can find him back at the Nexus where he, as well as just being a really likeable dude, provides you with key information on other characters. In fact, it's Bior who tells you about the existence and whereabouts of Yuria, even commending you for her rescue if you decide to do the right thing. And he also tells you Estrava's true name and identity, that being Ariona, son of the king, beseeching you to find him and tell him to get his pampered arse back to the Nexus where big uncle Bior can look after him. Like Ostrava though, Bior is one of the few who still believes in the integrity of King Awant, thinking that it can't truly have been him that wrought all this death and terror upon his kingdom, and Bior even stays behind to try and reach the king while his brother in arms, Valarfax, escaped back through the fog to tell the world of the demonic downfall of Boataria, though the king's knights and, in particular, his dragons were too much for Bior, hence his subsequent defeat and capture. For as great as Bior's commentary on the state of the world is though, thankfully he does venture back outside the Nexus where he can help you in the Penetrator fight but he also provides yet more lively commentary. And he later appears just before the King's Tower to once more challenge the dragon who guards the way onwards. I'd love to say that this event and encounter was really awesome and well done, perfectly showcasing the solid badassery of this noble knight of the realm, but for as entertaining as it is, it's kind of not great. Bior will repeatedly just strafe left and right, directly in front of the dragon, just allowing himself to be scorched by its breath again and again, though only does about 13 damage per hit. He is armed with a crossbow, but he'll never actually use it, meaning that it's on you to try and awkwardly kill the creature with its over 6000 HP before Bior gets thoroughly burnt to a crisp, which can be done, though I usually prefer to just soldier on through to King Alant telling myself that it's what the old knight would have wanted. As goofily executed as Bior's climax is, I still do like it because I really like him as a character. Demon Souls introduced precursors to lots of stuff that would reappear in some form in future games, like how the dragons were the precursor to the Hellkite Drake, and how the Vanguard Demon would evolve into the Asylum Demon, and then the stray demon from Dark Souls 3, and eventually even the Air Tree avatars from Elden Ring. And indeed, Bior is kind of the precursor to Siegmeier of Katarina, with his bold acts of bravery and his chronic narcolepsy. He's the man, and he's my favourite NPC in the game. We managed, did we? That salamander was more trouble than expected. Now, you go on ahead, you know me. I need a nap. For my honourable mention, I'm choosing Satsuki. Of course, this is another character who you can quite easily go a playthrough without even being aware of his existence. Though that's not because he's locked away in some distant tower or dungeon, but because Satsuki will only make an appearance if you've got either pure black world tendency, where he'll appear as a black phantom at the start of Island's Edge and the Shrine of Storms and attack you on sight, or if you've achieved pure white world tendency, he'll appear as a regular NPC in the same spot. I'm Satsuki. I seek a keepsake of my father. Have you seen the sword inscribed 
Makoto. The quest Satsuki sets you on is a very simple one, that being to retrieve a magical sword of magic called Makoto and bring it back to him. Of course, you'll likely have no idea where the hell this sword is, but if you ever made a few fruitless attempts at landing correctly on that stalagmite, downward patches kicks you into the pit to try and get the awkwardly placed item there, well, that very item happens to be Magic Sword Makoto, so thankfully it's down on the ground to be easily retrieved if you've got pure white world tendency. After getting the sword for Satsuki, there's really not anything you can do that leads to a happy outcome, other than just never return to him. If you show him the sword, he'll attack you with it. If you don't show him the sword, he attacks you for the sword. And if you approach him whilst wielding the sword, he'll also attack you for the sword. Cool feature of Makoto though is that it's cursed, and as such, Satsuki's health depletes by 1% per second whilst he's wielding it. Though the same applies to you if you decide to wield it against him. Stunning looking weapon too, by the way. This must be one of the best looking katanas of any FromSoft game. Satsuki isn't this grand, rich character or anything, but that's what I like about him. He's just this ominous and mysterious man looking for an ominous and mysterious sword, and your only reward for the completion of the quest is that you get to see him reveal his true colours. It's all very unconventional, but that's what makes it so cool. And now we come to Dark Souls where I think the NPCs got even better, where the quest lines became longer and more complex, often spanning across multiple different levels and sometimes having very different outcomes depending on your actions. Instead of the Nexus, our hub area is Firelink Shrine, and instead of there being over half a dozen people milling about from the outset, there's only one, this bull-haired prick in the corner who gifts us with a shiny penny. Hey, keep the change, you filthy animal. But, of course, there are plenty more folk to be discovered throughout the land of Lordran, many of whom will also make their way back to Firelink after we rescue them, though not all of them. Solaire, for example, never goes to Firelink. Needless to say, not only is Solaire of Astora a Soulsborn fan favourite, but he's pretty much THE fan favourite, thanks to his warm and pleasant demeanour, his iconic armour, and the extent to which he can help beginners overcome the potential brick wall of difficulty that is the Bell Gargoyles. But, for as great a character as Solaire is, he's not my favourite, because my favourite is Siegmeier of Katarina. Back when we were all first starting out in Dark Souls, when we were all desperately trying to learn how the game even worked and what the hell the story was and where the hell we were supposed to go next, shit can get rough, oppressively so. The Undead Burg was a challenge for sure, but the Undead Parish was even tougher with its bigger, burlier knights, not to mention the Channeler and his legion of buffed up hollows, which is what made it so nice when you crossed paths with Andre of Astora. Especially if you were initially intimidated by the sound of that relentless metallic banging, only to discover that its source is this kindly bearded blacksmith with a very pleasant voice. Well, you must be a new arrival. I'm Andre of Astora. But just nearby, sitting in front of an imposing iron gate, sits another friendly figure. Curiously garbed in the style of the onion. Mm. Mm. Oh, ho. forgive me. I was absorbed in thought. I am Siegmeier of Katarina. Quite honestly, I've run flat up against a wall. Or a gate, I should say. The thing just won't budge. This encounter is simply the first in a series of encounters with this knight of Katarina, where he is faced with an enemy or obstacle and doesn't quite know how to overcome it, remaining transfixed in a state of puzzlement over what to do next until you, the player, overcome it for him, always to his enormous surprise and knightly gratitude. He'll sit here in front of Sen's fortress until your actions result in the gate being raised, and then even once inside the fortress, he'll sit by the side of the boulder slope until you climb it yourself to manipulate the mechanism so that the boulders are hurled down elsewhere, thus allowing him to safely ascend. And the next time you see Siegmeier, he'll be chilling by a window in Anor Londo Castle, trying to work out how he's going to nail the three silver knights situated in the adjacent room, until you go in and do the job for him, like so. Oh. 
One of the things that makes Siegmeier so adorable is that even though you end up having to solve all these issues for him, it's not that he's too cowardly to take action, but rather he's just a bit bumbling and perhaps more noble than he is cunning, and it's clear that for as grateful as he is whenever we clear his path or take care of a few fearsome knights, it also shames him a little bit more each time, because he's meant to be the gallant knight here, not you. He'll even likely scold you at times, though again in a very endearing way. Gallantry entails great risks. Next time, give me a chance to come up with a plan. From here, Siegmeier's questline becomes a bit less straightforward, and I imagine this is probably around the time where a lot of people just stop following it altogether, because it's just not clear where to find him after he leaves Firelink Shrine here. He simply tells you that he's heading down below shortly, and the next thing you come back, he's gone. <sighs> okay, down below, you say. Well, directly below us lies the new Londo ruins, so maybe he's down there? Nope. Hmm, okay. What about Lower Undead Burg? Nope. The Depths? Nope. He's gone to Blighttown. It's a bit of a random place to find the man, but it also makes for quite a nice sight down here in this miserable swamp, where once again we help him out, this time by providing a purple moss clump for the poison. And hopefully you remember to bring a purple moss clump with you, otherwise back up you go to get one. You can also have an encounter with Siegmeier's daughter, Sieglind, at around about this point too, who's trapped in a golden golem near the Crystal Caves. You might even initially mistake her for her father from her identical armour, at least until she starts speaking in that adorable voice. It was you who rescued me. Why, thank you. I am Sieglind of Katarina. I don't know how I ended up in that crystal. It wasn't... Sieglund is in Lordran to search for her bumbling father, who always seems to have left the place right as she gets there, though the next place you find him is where the questline gets substantially more chaotic, and again, very easily missable. This time he's in Lost Isolith, and in a rather out of the way section too, in that bit with all the Chaos Eaters. Once again, Siegmeier is paralysed with indecision, seeing an obstacle but just not knowing how to overcome it, except, unlike in every other occasion, here he takes action in a reckless act of gallantry, exactly the type of gallantry he warned us against back in Anor Londo, and sadly, most of the time, it goes a little something like this. Well, that could not possibly have gone any worse, could it? Ah well, all I need to do is reload my save game and try again. Hold on a minute, I can't do that because this is Dark Souls. Oh well, time for another entire playthrough, I guess. No, thankfully I backed up my save before this, fully expecting this to happen. The smart thing to do is to pick off at least a couple Chaos Eaters from above first, substantially increasing your chances of success, though take care not to kill all of them, because while he will survive, his quest line will end here. While Siegmeier is again believed to have survived the fight, his relief is also tinged with some disappointment. The tables were supposed to turn here, he was supposed to be the one to take action and help you out, but yet again, you saved him. For the first half of Siegmeier's questline, he's a really fun and pleasant character, and you probably grow to like him even more upon meeting Siegland, who clearly loves her father a lot, but the Lost Isolith incident is that bit more sad and desperate than funny. And then after Lost Isolith, you get to hear Siegland say this back at Firelink. My father, if he went on his time and adventure, don't worry, that's just the way he is, I'm dead or no. Sort of reassuring, really. If he goes hollow, I'll just have to kill him again. Jeez. All of a sudden you start to realise that this noble Onion Knight has more layers than first seemed. And all this talk of a final adventure is a bit unnerving when you consider recent events. Indeed, if, at this point, you travel on to Ash Lake of all places, you come across a particularly sad scene of a dead Onion Knight, with his own daughter standing over him, having put him down just as she feared she might have to, though this time after having had his identity as a capable knight turned on its head again and again by us, Siegmeier went fully hollow, which means he won't be coming back. 
It's a beautifully heart-wrenching scene, especially with it being set here in this pale and lonely lake of ash, and a damn genius touch is that you're not initially sure who killed who at first, is that Siegmeier standing over his dead daughter, or vice versa. Either scenario is very unpleasant, and it's all super dark, made even more so when you consider how light-hearted it all started off. So, here I sit, in quite a pickle, weighing my options, so to speak. <laughs> my honourable mention goes to Shiva of the East. Quite a similar sort of character to Satsuki from Demon Souls, and one of the very few Soulsborne characters who are heavily Far Eastern inspired in their appearance and voice. You first meet Shiva after joining up with the Forest Clan Hunters in Darkroot, of which he is a loyal member. He won't initially be there, but both he and his bodyguards spawn in as soon as you join the Covenant, and the rest of the forest hunters in the area will also stop attacking you from this point on, as long as you don't betray the clan. There's really not a massive amount of in-game dialogue associated with Shiva, and not even a quest really. His main role is that of a vendor of rare and exotic weaponry, though he won't sell you anything here in the forest. In this location, he's just here to impart some friendly advice and look really awesome with his eastern armour, Iron Round Shield and Marakumo, though you can also farm the Marakumo from the giant skeletons in the Tomb of the Giants. Good luck with that though, because in all my years of playing Dark Souls, I have never once gotten it as a drop, and as far as I'm concerned, the less time spent in the Tomb of the Giants, the better. After speaking to Shiva in Darkroot, he'll migrate on down to Blight Town, always with his bodyguard furtively standing a respectable distance behind him, and it's here where you can purchase some really cool weapons from him, like the Flamberge and Washing Pole. And honestly, that's kind of all there is to Shiva, at least in the version of the game we got. Mind you, if you can restrain yourself from killing Patches before he makes it to Firelink Shrine, he actually comments on Shiva, though with a disrespectful misspelling of the man's name. Here, have you met that backwoods Shiva? Believe me on this one, bruv. The man is troubled. I can see it in his eyes. I just can. <laughs> no doubt about it. Watch it. It's curious that he says this because Shiva never really does or says anything towards us to evoke any distrust, though the threatening presence of his bodyguard can be a bit of an eyebrow raiser. However, there's actually unused dialogue for Shiva, where at some point in development, he had a proper quest that's very similar to where you had to search out Magic Sword Makoto for Satsuki in Demon Souls. Shiva even mentions the name Makoto here, except the sword he's after is the Chaos Blade, a boss weapon that you can create with a plus 10 katana and the soul of Quellag. Have you heard of Chaos Blade? The legendary sword of the ancient undead master Makoto. It's blade a swirling vortex. I heard it's somewhere around here, but I can't find it. It's all I could ever wish for. I'll do anything to have it. Why? Look at you. Just wait, will you? Your sword. Is it not the Chaos Blade? I've been searching for her for ages. I beg of you, and I promise repay you. Will you give the sword to me? Excellent! Much gratitude! As promised, this is for you. Go ahead, take it. Ah, oh, splendid! The Chaos Blade! Look into the vortex! Wonderful! Simply wonderful! His cut dialogue here is absolutely incredible too. I already loved Shiva's voice acting, but the stuff associated with the Chaos Blade questline is top tier, the way he instantly gets bewitched by the sword and goes mad with bloodlust. Awesome stuff, and a character I'm really fond of, even disregarding the cut content. And now we come to Dark Souls 2, whose world contains more NPCs than either Demon Souls or Dark Souls 1. You come across four of them very early on in fact, those being the three Firekeepers and Milibeth, though there's several more in Medulla who make for somewhat better company, like Molin the Armourer, Blacksmith Lenegrast, the Emerald Herald, and one of my personal favourites, Sweet Shalquar. Please check out my cat video. 
None of these colourful characters are my pick for favourite though, because there's a bunch more great ones out there with long and involved questlines too, all going through their own mental struggles and trying to journey their way through Drang Lake. And for as much as I love cats, I like Ben Hart of Jugo even more. You can first find Ben Hart very nearby to Majula, sitting down in front of the entrance to the Shaded Woods, though as he explains, the way forward is blocked by an uncomfortably lifelike statue of a woman. The way under is all blocked up, you see, by this god awful statue. Heavens above! Who thought it a good idea to put it there? There are a couple of noteworthy aspects to Ben Hart. For a start, he's the only character in the game with a Scottish accent, but even if he didn't, I'd still have given him the top spot, please believe me. The other and main noteworthy thing about him though, is that he appears to be in possession of a very familiar sword, one that we saw previously in Demon Souls Swamp of Sorrow as the Large Sword of Moonlight, where it's scaled entirely with a faith stat, and then again in Dark Souls 1, where it could be obtained after hacking off the tail of Seath the Scaleless, being called the Moonlight Greatsword, and scaling entirely with intelligence. And indeed, it would also go on to be an intelligence weapon in its Dark Souls 3 and Elden Ring iterations, and an arcane weapon in Bloodborne. This first time we encounter Ben Hart, we help him in much the same way as with Siegmeier, where he's flummoxed by an obstacle until we deal with it for him, though that's about the extent of the similarity between the two characters, because from this point on, Ben Hart is simply the man, making his own way and helping us out with some key boss fights throughout the game. After Shaded Woods, the next time you see him is quite a bit later in Drang Lake Castle, and he can even be summoned as a phantom for the Looking Glass Night boss though very important to ensure he stays alive for the whole encounter, which can be quite tricky to be honest, especially with how bosses become a good deal tankier when fought with allies in this game. Mind you, Ben Hart makes for a pretty badass ally with that grand sword of his, and you can also summon him for the Prowling Magus boss. It does sound silly, but to be fair his summon sign is a good bit before the actual boss arena, and so he is a good help against all the falconers and pigs here. Seriously, this section is absolutely awful. Dark Souls 2 has some great levels, especially in the DLCs, but I don't like Brightstone Cove Seldora one bit. Thought I was going to have to play through it all again too, due to Ben Hart being absolutely battered by the time we got to the fog wall, but thankfully it's a prowling Magus fight, and so it was not a challenge to keep him kicking. The reason I was bothering to summon Ben Hart here at all though was not simply for the pleasure of the company of a fellow Scotsman, but because to progress his questline you have to summon him for three bosses and keep him alive till the end. It's the same requirement for if you're working through Lucatiel's questline. That's so she was. Look at her. You can eventually summon Ben Hart for the fight with the giant lord in the memory of Jay after obtaining the Ashen Mist Heart from the ancient dragon, and after this he can be found in the memory of Oro where he'll give you all his clothes, thanks I guess, but more importantly his blade too, called the Blue Moon Greatsword in Dark Souls 2, though upon closer inspection it seems a bit off. For a start, not only does it not do any magic damage, but it also has no stat scaling of any kind. Furthermore, the item description starts off very promisingly, even mentioning a pale white being, clearly a reference to Seath the Scaleless from Dark Souls 1, but ends in, then what explains this lifeless weapon? Perhaps there has been some mistake. Indeed, if you take the Blue Moon Greatsword over to Maulin the Armourer in Majua, he will appraise it for you, initially assuming it to be the genuine article, just as we did, before confirming it as a fake. Though if you're playing on New Game Plus, you can get a hold of the real thing, after transposing it from the old Pale Drake Soul at Weaponsmith on effects for the Moonlight Greatsword, which, unlike its imitation, does boast superb scaling with intelligence can send forth blue waves of damaging moonlight. The swords even look different too, with the blue moon greatsword being shorter and more wide compared to the longer and more majestic moonlight greatsword. Sadly, Ben Hart never acknowledges this in any way, and nor does he have any extra dialogue if you speak to him with the real blade. And also, if you summon him for the final battles at the Throne of Want, he's still using the blue moon greatsword, even though he gave it to you earlier. Even so, I love the way this recurring sword was used with Ben Hart. 
He's just a pretty simple travelling warrior making his way through this dangerous land and helping us out in difficult battles, fighting with his old family sword with the belief that one day, perhaps after enough monsters have been slain, its true power will awaken and that he will be the one to have awoken it, and all the while it's just some shitty fake of unknown origin. Even so, I couldn't resist the urge to wear his set for the fight with the Throne Watcher and Defender, fighting alongside him as brothers, him with his Blue Moon Greatsword and me with my Moonlight Greatsword, until death. My honourable mention goes to someone infinitely more sinister than Benhart. It goes to Royal Sorcerer Navlan. Your first encounter with this Agent of Chaos is a pretty unique one with him being held behind an impenetrable barrier on the ground level of Aldeus Keep. I mean, I say impenetrable but on the other side of the hall you can pull a lever which will lower the barrier to set him free, though after looking at the many soapstone messages on the ground, perhaps best not. Navlan might seem like something of a dead end when you first talk to him but that depends on whether you're human or hollowed. If you're human, all he'll ever do here is beg you to leave him be, that no good will come of you being near him. But if you speak to him whilst hollowed, his demeanour is… different. Well, you're nicely hollowed, aren't you? Are you tormented by memories? Burdened by guilt? Now the question, are you ready for more? If you are, then we all. See, there is an alter ego lurking within the depths of this sorcerer's soul. He meddled and experimented with magic so as to bring new forms of sorcery into the world, but what he ended up doing was to create this malevolent spirit which inhabited his own body as a vessel, moving with murderous autonomy as he slept, leading to him sealing himself in here where he can't get to anyone. Unless... His imprisonment does not stop us being able to converse with Navlan though, and he does fully own up to his nature, that being that he just loves killing. But he's trapped behind there and we're free out here which means he wants us to do some killing for him in a series of assassinations. It's very similar to the Mephistopheles questline from Demon's Souls, who also tasks you with killing a bunch of people for enticing rewards. Of course, in that game the people you were killing were very important characters, and probably ones you really liked, in fact, she even has you kill Bior at one point, I could never, and the same is partly true here. The first target is Laddersmith Gilligan, followed by Kale the Cartographer, then Felkin the Outcast. None of these characters are all that important really, but even so they've done you no wrong. But the last target is the Emerald Herald herself, the one who allows you to actually level up. Important aspect to this questline though is that unlike with Mephistopheles, you don't actually need to kill a single person. In every case, it's possible to retrieve an item of theirs through conventional and moral means, which Navlan will then accept as proof of their death with no suspicion of deception. But I'm making a goddamn video here and I thought that wouldn't be very sporting, so I slaughtered each and every target. Even the Herald, though her death left me kinda cold. The others at least put up a fight and tell you to go fuck yourself, but the Herald says absolutely nothing and doesn't even fight back and it's pretty sad. But hey, that's the questline over now and I got my reward, a powerful sorcery. I guess I'll be on my way now, nothing more for me here. appreciate the ramifications. Well, no matter. What's done is done. Besides, I've found myself a new mark. <laughs> now, for as much as I love the game, when it comes to NPCs, Dark Souls 3 is a bit of a tricky one for me. Because, compared to the games which came before it, I feel that this one is where the questlines got particularly convoluted and obscure, to the point where the steps required to complete a lot of them are often excessively specific, not at all intuitive, easily missed and easily fucked up. Out of any FromSoft game, 
This is the one where I most frequently find myself starting quests, progressing them along a little bit and then just abandoning them halfway through because unless I look up exactly what steps to take to complete them, I just don't know where to go. Even so, the game still has a bunch of really great characters with great storylines which, with this being Dark Souls 3, usually end in some depressing way. There's even a new knight of Katarina too, that being Sigward, wearing the exact same armour as Siegmeier and even being voiced by the same dude, though for as much as I like Sigward, he's not my pick, though my pick does happen to be another character I mentioned earlier. It's Unbreakable Patches slash Lap. The very first encounter with Patches is a prime example of an event that can be very easily missed. After opening the large door at the front of the Cathedral of the Deep from the inside, fairly nearby you can encounter the aforementioned Sigward in his characteristic onion armour, armed with his pierce shield and claymore. Mm. Well, you look reasonably sane. I am a knight of Katarina. I've managed to track down this cathedral's store of treasure. <laughs> hmm. Sounds a wee bit different than he usually does. Oh well, if you can't trust an onion, who can you trust? Let's see what's over there. <laughs> Shame on you, you greedy guts. Thought you could outwit an onion. Well, say hello to the nice giant. He adores visitors. Gotta say, out of every Patches encounter from any FromSoft game, I think this one is my absolute favourite. Usually he just violently boots you down a dark hole, but this makes for a hilarious change, especially if you already dispatched the two giants down here, in which case he gets furious and curses you out, as if you're the bad guy in this situation. Then he acts completely innocent when you confront him about it, as if this is your very first encounter with the man, even though he literally took off his helmet before and exposed his face and regular speaking voice. Ugh, Patches, I can't stay mad at you, you lovable rogue. You can also buy the Katarina set off him here and throw it down to Sigward who's stuck down in a well outside the cleansing chapel, naked in the dark. Thing is though, you can easily miss your chance of even seeing this event if you visit Rosaria before this, after which Onion Patches simply despawns here forever. How could you possibly know this? Well, like I said, unless you're using a wiki at every step, you couldn't, but that's the last time I'll harp on about that. To be fair, even if you do miss Patches here, you can still see him again later, and if you thought he might have changed his weight since the last time you forgave him, think again. Hey, you know the saying, fool me once, shame on you. Fill me twice, fuck you. After purchasing the tower key from the handmaiden at Firelink Shrine and then ascending it to retrieve the Firekeeper's soul, upon trying to leave, Patches has locked you in, acting like a massive c delightedly relishing the thought of stripping your dead body of all its valuables. Uh, we'll see about that, you fucking ball bag. I've come clean. I did you wrong. I didn't mean it though. Not one bit. Okay, I forgive you. Patch's core questline is kinda interesting because it overlaps with both Sigward's and Grey Rat's. Of course, he stole Sigward's armour before which we then returned to the Onion Knight, progressing his questline, and if you send Grey Rat out on an expedition to Erethil to collect more goods to sell to you, he'll return safe and sound, though if you did not return Sigward's armour you can actually have Patches go and rescue Grey Rat, showing that for as big and bald a bastard as he may be, he does have some twisted sense of morality or loyalty in his heart, though if you proceed to send Grey Rat out again to scavenge in Lothric Castle, even though you can send Patches out on yet another rescue mission, Grey Rat will always die there. It's good stuff and I really like this iteration of Patches, certainly more than I liked him in the Demon's Souls remake. He's always been a butt ugly dude, but it straight up makes me mad to look at him in that game. Those facial animations are hideous and not good. That aside though, if Dark Souls 3 had simply left the character there, he would not have made it as my favourite NPC. However, in the Ringed City DLC you can encounter a curiously armoured knight with a very familiar voice, but this time, surprisingly, he is not out to deceive you. Even though he sounds alarmingly similar to Patches, this character is named Lap, 
claiming to be a hollow who has lost his memory, and with it, the knowledge of his actual identity, to the point where he has no idea who he used to be or even what his name was. I have a feeling we're going to make a fabulous team. Oh, you'll see. You'll see. Oh, in all honesty, there's something I should tell you. I'm a hollow. Yes. I try to play it off, but I haven't a clue about my past. The issue is that we do know, and so for sincere as Lap sounds, we as players have been conditioned to not believe a word of it. Yet the tale he tells you here about some precious treasure hidden in the poisonous swamp turns out to be completely true, and he's even very pleasant when you tell him that you found it. And not only that, but you can summon Lap for the Demon Prince boss fight just ahead. Lap acts as a very welcome, friendly figure throughout the Dreg Heap and the Ringed City, though his main goal is to reach the Purging Monument, which he says will help him restore his memory and identity with regular Purging Stones no longer working like they used to. You can even see the very monument he's talking about off in the distance here, and after making it there yourself, you can tell Lap of its location, if you think that seems like a good idea. Well, after telling him where it is, you can find him in the spiral staircase section just after where you first encountered Medir flying around, only his posture is a bit different here, not to mention the tone of his voice. Now I know exactly who I was, and for that, I have a little thanks to be giving. Go this way and peep past the broken staircase. Some awfully fine treasures just sitting there all alone. Indeed, if it wasn't immediately apparent, Lap is patches once more, solidifying his transformation with an all too recognisable kick to the arse, though for once he's not kicking us down into some dark pit to rob our corpse of its trinkets. Without a doubt my favourite iteration of patches from any FromSoft game, to the point where I kind of wish they'd have left the character be after Dark Souls 3 instead of bringing him back for Elden Ring, because the Lap storyline felt like the perfect send off to the single biggest prick in Soulsborne. As for my honourable mention, it goes to Sir Wilhelm from the Ashes of Ariando DLC. You first encounter Wilhelm standing outside Frida's chapel across the bridge, addressing you rather sternly but still inviting you to enter to listen to the words of his precious lady, all with that absurdly gravelly voice of his. Your Lady Yuria's Lord of Hollows. No bell tolls, and yet you've slipped into the painting. Oh, no matter. If you've lost your way, the words of Lady Frida will guide you. This voice actor's been in a lot of games of course, like Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice, The Witcher 3 and Greedfall, though Dark Souls 3 was my first time hearing him, and I think his makes for the perfect voice for this extremely badass knight, sporting one of the coolest armour sets in the game with one of the sickest weapons, the Onyx Blade. Lore-wise, Sir Wilhelm was a knight of the Sable Church in Londor, of which Elfrida, the eldest of three sisters, was leader. Another sister is Yuria, who you can encounter in Firelink Shrine if you befriended Yol near the Undead Settlement, with Yuria being the one who guides you towards the usurpation of Fire Ending. Wilhelm even references her here if you've met her beforehand, including if you try attacking him, though his appearance at this section of the Painted World is merely an illusion, hence why he disappears. Much further on through the level though, beyond the Corvian settlement, you do encounter the real Sir Wilhelm, guarding the way onwards to the painter, wielding his black flame onyx blade given to him by Elfrida as a farewell gift, which he accepted, though instead of leaving her service, he remained by her side, leading to many Dark Souls 3 players viewing him as something of a love-struck simp. Mind you, any mocking words that I've had for this Dark Knight tend to stick in my throat as soon as I begin actually fighting him, because he makes for one of, if not the, most difficult NPC fights in the game. Super tanky, super powerful, super mobile, can cast Vow of Silence to prevent spell usage, and can heal himself up with miracles. In short, he's a fucking nightmare. Interesting detail after Wilhelm's defeat though is that you can subsequently find his armour down in the rotting corpse pit with those disgusting giant insects, I guess indicating that he crawled down here to die after we beat him, which is a pretty bloody miserable ending. 
I mentioned that in Dark Souls 3 I am oft to be found bypassing the NPC quest lines, but for as much as I love Bloodborne, historically I've often ended up doing the same thing here too. In fact, over my first few playthroughs of the game I barely engaged with the whole Odin Chapel jamboree you can get going. I somehow just ended up missing everyone, and not even knowing characters like Ariana even existed, or that you can send Adela the Nun here too, not to mention our dear sweet grandmother. Despite that, out of any FromSoft game, I think Bloodborne has the best NPCs. You meet some strange and messed up characters in the other games for sure, but the ones here all have that peculiar Yarnamite madness to them that makes many of them so menacingly entertaining to talk to, be it face to face or from behind a window or door. But for as much as I love all that, my pick for favourite goes to someone else entirely. It goes to Alfred. At first, there's really nothing all that compelling about Alfred. You first meet him in Cathedral Ward on the path to Old Yarnum, standing in front of a shrine. He's friendly as hell right from the outset, and no wonder with you being a hunter, just as he used to be. Later though, Alfred would join a group called the Executioners, as led by Master Logarius, and where the job of hunters is to kill beasts, the prime directive of the Executioners is to wipe out all vile bloods from the face of the earth. Oh, good to see you safe. Now, let's think up something to discuss. Just tell me what piques your interest. Ah, there's something I want to tell you. A bit of wisdom from the eminent master Logarius. Once, a scholar betrayed his fellows at Bergenworth, and brought forbidden blood back with him to Canehurst Castle. Although Alfred tells you some interesting and insightful details about Yarnum, the healing church and Bergenworth, he'll initially just move to a different section of the Cathedral Ward near the entrance to the Forbidden Woods for a bit more dialogue, but as he says, he's searching for a path to Canehurst. Forsaken Castle Canehurst is totally cut off from Yarnum, of course, with the bridge there being completely destroyed, but we can get there by grabbing the Canehurst summons from Iasefka's clinic, allowing us to travel there by horse-drawn carriage directly from Hemwick Charnel Lane. At the top of Canehurst there's a boss fight with the same Logarius earlier mentioned by Alfred, though instead of him being called Master Logarius, he's known here as Martyr Logarius, due to him having, in a sense, sacrificed his body to stand frigid vigil up here on the castle rooftops, and indeed, after his defeat and after donning the crown of illusions he leaves behind, the way to Annalise, Queen of the Vilebloods, is revealed. You can become a Vileblood yourself here if you like, partaking of Annalise's cursed blood before venturing out and hunting other hunters for blood dregs to gift to your new queen, but you can also grab the unopened summons here which can be given to Alfred, allowing him to get to Canehurst the same way you did. Aha! Is that the sigil of Canehurst? I've heard tell of Canehurst nobles and their amusingly pompous invitations. Wonderful. I thank you profusely. He's still pleasant here and grateful for the gift, but there's a new slightly fervent edge to his voice that was not quite there before, though he does gift you with the Wheel Hunter's badge, allowing for the purchase of the Wheel of Logarius weapon. This is great and all, and up until now he's been a fun character to talk to when you see him around Cathedral Ward, but this ain't nothing. You can call it quits here and just go about your business towards ending the hunt, but if you travel back over to Canehurst, back to Queen Annalise, you are greeted with this scene. I've done it! I've done it! I smashed and pounded and grounded this rotten siren into fleshy pink pulp! There, you filthy monstrosity! What good's your immortality now? Try stirring up trouble in this sorry state, all mangled and twisted with every inside on the outside for all the world to see! <laughs> hands down the single sickest and most grisly scene in Bloodborne. It's hardcore as fuck, 
but the thing that makes it even more shocking is that five minutes ago, Alfred was so civilised and pleasant, and then you come here and he's turned into a raving, gore-splattered lunatic, accentuated all the more by his bizarre wheel weapon and alarming choice of headwear. The way Annalise's remains are still likely pulsating in her chair is also very unsettling, indicating that she's still alive in some sense. Alfred continues raving like a madman if you attack him here, even calling you an unclean wench, though maybe he calls you something different if you're playing as a man, I'm not sure. And this was around the time where I realised that this is the same voice actor who played Solaire in Dark Souls 1. You don't look hollow, far from it. I am Solaire of Astora, an adherent of the Lord of Sunlight. You may call me Alfred, protégé of Master Ligarius, hunter of vile bloods. After the fight, you can bring Annalise back to life if you take her queenly flesh over to the Altar of Despair, but disappointingly she does not have any new dialogue at all afterwards to acknowledge the fact that she was pounded into a mush the day before and that you literally just resurrected her. Even so, great questline with an awesome ending. I will never forget the first time I strode back into this hall to see Alfred so transformed from his former self. My honourable mention goes to a character who was not present in Bloodborne at launch. He was added into the game in an update which coincided with the release of the Old Hunters DLC, though you don't actually need to own the DLC to see him. It's Volter, Master of the League. As great a character as Volter is, I was already sold on him before even engaging with him in dialogue. Good God, that must be one of the coolest looking clothing sets in the game, especially with the weird one-eyed bucket helm. But then I did start talking to him and the deal was sealed even further. Just as Alfred was played by the Solaire voice actor, Volter is voiced by the Vengaro voice actor from Dark Souls 2 and one of my all-time favourite vocal performances from any of these games. Why not join the league? Yes, as a hunter well should. The night brims with defiled scum and is permeated by their rotten stench. Just think, now you're all set to hunt and kill to your heart's content. Hunt in cooperation with your fellows, your League Confederates. <laughs> he speaks with such intense, frightening fervour, to the point where it's not quite clear if he's even sane especially if you're not quite sure what he's referring to with his talk of vermin, but if you equip the impurity rune he gives you, you can get vermin by assisting folk with bosses, appearing as a sort of bloody centipede. Vermin are only seen by members of the League, though the item description vaguely implies that these creatures might be imaginary, stating those who wish to see vermin can, and those who choose are provided with boundless purpose. If you don't like doing co-op or can't find anyone to help, there are three especially powerful old hunters in the DLC who each drop a vermin. I was on New Game Plus here and already had a couple and so I just beat these three again for five in total, which is all you need to finish Volter's questline. After crushing five of them, he recognises your dedication to the League and passes the role of Master of the League on to you, leaving behind that slick as hell one-eyed bucket helm behind to coincide with his departure from the Forbidden Woods, allowing you to complete the ensemble if you picked up the rest of the constable set in The Hunter's Nightmare, the description of which reads, Once upon a time a troop of foreign constables chased a beast all the way to Yarnum, and this is what they wore. The constables became victims of the beast, except for one survivor, who in turn devoured the creature whole, all by himself. The fable is a favourite among Yarnamites, who are partial to any stories of pompous, intolerant foreigners who suffer for their ignorance. It makes the blood taste that much sweeter. Indeed, if you intend on challenging Lawrence first vicar after this, Volter can be summoned, not as master of the league, but as Volter Beast Eater, with his face revealed too, now that he's passed his helmet on to you. Super interesting character with some of the best voice acting of any FromSoft game, and like Alfred, he's clearly batshit insane. Also, a main character trait of his is that he literally eats beasts, how could I not include him here? 
And now we come to the outlier of the group, the game most different to all others on this list, having a far greater focus on stealth and a significantly reduced focus on build experimentation. Even so, Sekiro still has its share of great NPCs with excellent stories, and what's more, for the first time dialogue actually is dialogue, with our protagonist Wolf audibly responding back to the characters who we meet, albeit rather sparingly, he's not the most talkative sort. There was a decent wee selection of characters I could have chosen as my favourite, but right before I even started putting together my list, I knew exactly who I'd be choosing. I am choosing Ishin Ashina. Now, unlike the other characters on this list, Ishin also acts as a boss. In fact, you can fight him in three different forms. Ishin Ashina, where he fights as his current old age self. Ishin Sword Saint, where he is brought back into the world from the severed body of his adopted grandson as he was in his prime. And Inner Ishin, his most advanced version, only accessible via the gauntlet content. I'm not picking Ishin as my favourite NPC based on any of that though, because even disregarding the times you fight him, he's the most badass character in the game. You first encounter the old samurai near the battlefield where Gyobu Oniwa was fought, except he's disguised as the Tengu of Ashina, where he's just about ready to kill Wolf until he spots his shinobi prosthetic. <laughs> <laughs> From this point on, the Tengu is your ally, and you can find him again just before delving down into the sunken valley. Though, of course, his true identity is indeed Ishin Ashina, who at all other times is secluded in his castle and tended to by his physician, Lady Emma, due to him suffering from some unspecified terminal illness. Even though he looks tall and imposing as hell as the Tengu, you can see the way his body has been ravaged by sickness when you see him at the castle. The curious thing about Ishin though is that even though his grandson, Genichiro, is your staunch enemy, he is out to help you, knowing that for as much as he loves his country, the country he literally took back from Japan's interior ministry in the rebellion depicted in the game's opening cutscene, he knows that the immortality that Genichiro seeks to weaponize against the ministry is not a force to be meddled with be it via the rejuvenating sediment, via infestation, or via the power of the divine heir's blood, as gifted in earnest to Wolf. That's what I love most about Ishin as a character. He's not really presented as this safe, moral character, but rather, he was a very dangerous man with a bloody past, one of the most skilled killers of his time, both now and back then in his prime. But he also has an unflinching moral code. He's not really good, or bad, he's just Ishin Ashina, he's a force to be reckoned with. Sekiro has a great feature where you can find different types of sake throughout the land to be given to either the sculptor, Emma or Ishin, and depending on the type of sake you gift them, you'll get back different dialogue and learn more about their pasts, and you can hear some great stuff from Ishin this way, details about his past experiences with Shura and about the rebellion. Sake. おお、気が利くな。どれ。よい先じゃ。勝ち戦の時はこうして飲んだものよ。足なしの皆でな。国取り戦の足なし。国取りか。<笑> それは<笑> He meets a pretty sad ending too, regardless of your actions. 
If you choose to betray Kuro and become Shura, you need to fight him directly with his disappointment and disapproval being just as brutal to face as his pillars of fire. But if you go for any other ending, he'll simply succumb to his illness as the interior ministry invades, lying dead on the floor beside Emma, sword in hand. Though of course, he is then resurrected for a final fight with Wolf shortly after. My honourable mention for Sekiro is the Sculptor. Wolf first encounters the Sculptor after his arm is sliced off during the fight with Genichiro, dragging him back to his dilapidated temple to recover where he replaces Wolf's left arm with the Shinobi prosthetic. The prosthetic is of course a main gameplay feature in Sekiro, but it's also very important narratively, with it having originally been created by Emma's father, Dogen. See, Cycles are a big thing in FromSoft's games. The Dark Souls games revolve around the linking of the fire to bring about a new age, before the fire eventually weakens, requiring it to be relinked, thus initiating a new cycle. Bloodborne revolves around the hunt, with who knows how many hunts having taken place prior to our character's entrance into Yharnam, and in the Honouring Wishes ending, the player can even take the place of Germin, continuing on in the hunter's dream to facilitate some future hunter to do exactly as we did before perhaps they take our place and continue on the cycle of hunts. Well, Sekiro doesn't quite play out in the same way, but many of the events and characters in this story do have parallels with past events, as if history is repeating itself. Emma is playing the part of her father, Dogen, giving us medical advice and tending to our healing gourd. Kuro's wish to sever his immortality is very similar to a previous divine heir named Lord Takeru who also wished to sever his immortality, and our character, Wolf, is like a new iteration of the sculptor who was himself a shinobi who fought with Ishin during the rebellion. After years of killing, however, he succumbed to Shura, leading to Ishin cutting his arm off to quell the flames of hatred, after which the shinobi prosthetic was developed for him before later being passed on to Wolf. This is why Ishin laughs at Wolf the first time he encounters him as the Tengu. He recognises the prosthetic and knows who gave it to him, and it's another example of events repeating themselves. Ishin cut the sculptor's arm off, and then later his grandson did the same for Wolf. The sculptor is extremely sullen throughout most of the game, not entirely dissimilar to the demeanour of Wolf himself, though he does warm up somewhat as the story progresses. From around the halfway point of the game, he'll start saying this line when you leave him, which I've always found to be quite touching. <laughs> Also, like Ishin, you can ply him with liquor, evoking details and stories about his time as a shinobi, and the regrets he accrued after all those years of killing, reducing him to this state where he's alone in this temple, carving sculpture after sculpture of the Buddha, with every single one appearing wrathful, a reflection of the state of his own soul. Just as you fight Ishin as a boss, you can also fight the sculptor, though not in his human form, but as the demon of hatred. It's not immediately apparent that this is even him, I certainly did not put two and two together when fighting this thing for the first time, but the demon's missing left arm is a giveaway, as well as the words it says upon its defeat. Well then, finally we come to by far the biggest game on the list with the most NPCs, many of whose questlines span across several regions of the lands between. In fact, 
I'm of the opinion that it's kind of an issue, because with the world being so ridiculously expansive, it became harder than ever to organically follow these questlines, even if you're trying to explore thoroughly. For example, it literally took me about four goddamn playthroughs before I came across Dialos here in Leonia, and there are still a few characters whose stories I have never experienced to completion. But, for as excellent as many of them are, for me, to my tastes, there's one who I've been utterly compelled by right from the first moment I saw his loathsome form, the Dung Eater. First time we see the Dung Eater is in the game's opening sequence, showing him hanging dead from a noose amidst an angry crowd, just like how the rest of the tarnish from this sequence are also shown dead, later to rise back up, though it's not until you make it to Altus Plateau that you finally get to meet the Malison with his glowing red projection sitting among piles of defiled, rotting corpses in the round table hold. In the intro, the narrator specifically refers to him as the loathsome dung eater, and indeed, upon meeting him it's quickly made abundantly clear why he's viewed as such. Have you ever felt the curse? With your whole being, the pox upon life itself, feared and despised by all. The reviled blessing. <laughs> Apparently not. You are but a lamb, a stranger to defilement, ignorant of your own ignorance. You no longer interest me. It's not quite clear what sort of curse he's talking about here, but whatever it is, it sounds evil, cruel, and horrific, especially when you consider the appearance of this deliverer of defilement. The Dung Eater's armour is of course intended to resemble cut off omen horns, such as the kind featured on the omens in the subterranean shunning grounds. He isn't an omen himself, but as the description of his armour reads, worn by the Dung Eater, its form is a vision of the landscape of his mind, and of his appearance as he wished to see it. The heart of an omen without the body to match, could there be any crueler existence? What does it matter then if the curse claims at all? Right from the start, it's clear that this is an utterly misanthropic individual with a twisted view of the world, though at this point he won't do anything except sit in this secluded section of the hold and threaten you with death and defilement if you disturb him further. However, if you come across a seedbed curse when you're out on your travels like the one found quite early on in Landell, he changes his tune somewhat, detecting the scent of the curse on you now that you're that bit more familiar with it. The item description for a seedbed curse reads, Curse grown on a corpse killed and defiled by the Dung Eater, a tender pox afflicted with omen horns. The Dung Eater cultivates the seedbed curse on corpses. By doing so, he prevents dead souls returning to the Erd Tree, leaving them forever cursed, one of the most loathsome things found in the lands between. The curse he bestows upon people is the same one which naturally afflicts omens, hence his omen-esque appearance and his use of their horns to inflict the curse. In the lands between, everything revolves around the Erd Tree and the Golden Order, and thus anything believed to be outside of the Golden Order is in turn reviled, just like omens and the misbegotten. And so, the idea of being forever cut off from his grace, even in death, is viewed as the ultimate evil the greatest fear of the inhabitants of this world, though perversely, the Dung Eater views it as some sort of blessing. After finding at least one seedbed curse, he gives you a key which can be used to open his cell in the subterranean shunning grounds, freeing his corporeal form out into the world, not entirely dissimilar to what you can do with the royal sorcerer Navlan, who is similarly locked away. He doesn't even recognise you here, indicating that the real deal is somehow even more out of his mind than his spirit back in the round table hold. He'll just perpetually bash his head against this increasingly bloody wall until you talk to him, and it's all pretty fucking grim and horrifying and miserable. After freeing him here, his projection leaves the hold, though he leaves a message instructing you to go to the Landell Outer Moat. If you've been following Blagger Big Boggart's questline, you'll find him here selling crabs, though he also specifically warns you about the Dung Eater, you know, that monster we just freed. There's something I should probably tell you. You heard of the Dung Eater? He's a madman. Has it out for everyone. Curses him. Goes round in his rank armour and all. You see him though. Stay well away. 
I was in the same jail as him once, so I know first hand. He's a god-forsaken monster. Not just some petty thug like me. He's a killer. Kills people. And curses the souls. Does all sorts of shit to the corpses. To keep them cursed forever. I ain't seen nothing more disgusting in all my years. I ever been more scared than either. Rooted to the bloody spot. Molly did that. To my friend. If you come back here afterwards, regrettably, Boggart has been afflicted in exactly the same way as his friend, having been brutalised and then defiled by the Dung Eater, begging us to kill him before he passes away, whereupon he leaves behind yet another seedbed curse, after which the Dung Eater invades for the first time letting us see his choice of weapon, that being the Sword of Milos a cruel tool literally fashioned from the spinal column of a stunted giant. At first I didn't quite understand this weapon's significance to the Dung Eater, but the key here is that Milos, whose spine this was, is described as having been undersized for a giant, and was viewed as solid and terribly grotesque. It's pretty clear that the Dung Eater is also someone who has been viewed as solid and grotesque throughout his life, probably even before he took on this persona, and perhaps his choice of weapon is intended to be symbolic, using the body part of a freak to enact his will upon the world he has never felt welcome in. The Ash of War for the Sword of Milos is even a tortured shriek, perfectly fitting the Dung Eater's character and making this encounter all the more dramatic. Defeating him here does not spell his end, however, and in fact, his spirit is right back there in the round table hold, where he has a sort of twisted epiphany. I thought, then it hit me, that you are, in fact, me, and I am the Dung Eater. It is my flesh that must receive the blessing. Thus, we are become the Dung Eater if that's the path you really want to go down. Five seedbed curses are required now, three of which are obtainable in Laindel, one of which is in Volcano Manor, and two of which are in Elfail, Brace of the Halo Tree. There are six in total, but only five are needed. From here, another visit to the Dung Eater's corporeal flesh is required, secluded back in his subterranean cell, and it's our turn to defile him, resulting in some incredibly unsettling noises. The game never goes into specific detail regarding exactly what this defilement entails, but that just makes it seem all the more depraved and terrifying. Some horror is more effective when left to the imagination. After the Dung Eater has been sufficiently defiled, he passes away but leaves behind the mending rune of the Fell Curse, a grim glyph adorned with horns and pustules, a symbol which both literally and figuratively represents his life's work. After defeating Godfrey, Radigan and finally the Elden Beast, the Mending Rune of the Fell Curse can be incorporated into the Elden Ring, subjecting every inhabitant of the lands between to an inescapable, all-encompassing defilement, forever cutting them, their children and their children's children off from the golden grace of the Air Tree, now turned dim, pale and deathly. Well, that was depressing, but my honourable mention goes to someone who is significantly more likeable, Bloody Finger Hunter Yura. First place you can encounter Yura is in Limgrave near Lake Agil, where he gives you a heads up about the titular dragon who lives nearby. As with just about every NPC I've talked about in this video, Yura looks incredibly sick. Just like Satsuki and Shiva, his attire is very much Eastern inspired, particularly his iron kasa, which is made to imitate the woven straw hats worn in the land of reeds. And again, just like many other NPCs, he has an incredible voice. You do well to steer clear of a gill lake, fledgling. A dragon roosts there. 
and it's as fearsome as it is majestic. So, unless you're mad or wish to be burned alive, stay clear of the lake. If you happen to die to the dragon Agil, Yura will lambast you as a halfwit, though will offer no further advice or assistance, but if you travel up the nearby ravine past Murkwater Cave, you'll be invaded by someone called Bloody Finger Nereus. He can make for a pretty difficult fight thanks to his Reduvia weapon which causes a lot of damage and bleed buildup, especially from its projectiles, but 20 seconds into the invasion, Yura will join the battle and help you out, very slowly running towards you all the way over from the lake. It takes a while. Indeed, this is Yura's purpose in the Lands Between, that being to hunt down bloody fingers, invaders of other worlds who live to kill other tarnished. You can serve as a bloody finger yourself too if you get the bloody finger item, which as far as I know functions the same as the red eye orb from Dark Souls, though I confess I'm actually extremely ignorant of the PvP side of things in Elden Ring. After this encounter, Yura will soften to you a lot more and even assist you with the Agil fight if you actually manage to spot his fucking summon sign, which is not a given. After the battle, he will impart some information about what to do with the dragon heart you got from the dragon saying that it can be used to partake in Dragon Communion to learn Draconic abilities, though he also warns you of the potential ramifications from going down this path. Indeed, the various magma worms you encounter throughout the Lands Between are grim examples of former humans who hungered after the power of dragons, consuming heart after heart to the point where they transformed entirely. It's why magma worms have second phases where they start walking on two legs and use their swords in the manner of a human. I'm imagining for most people this is about as far as they get with Yura's questline. That was certainly the case for me until I eventually had to look up how the hell to progress it, but near the academy gate point of grace in Lyurnia, there is a red summon sign where instead of Yura flying in to rescue you, you assist him in a fight with bloody finger Ravenmount assassin. Again, he thanks you here but also mentions a different bloody finger, one he has been after for a while, the most deadly one of all. Yet again, it's very easy to pass over the next step in this questline, but if you visit the second church of Marika in Altus Plateau, Yura can be found dying on the ground, having been mortally wounded by Eleonora, another knight from the land of reeds who wields a similarly stylish weapon to Yura, that being Eleonora's pole blade. Interestingly, you can also see her use dragon abilities in this fight, with this perhaps at least partially having something to do with her ultimate corruption and descent into a bloody finger, consumed by the cessblood, as Yura puts it, clearly having some connection to Moog, Lord of Blood and his formless mother, hence why she drops the purifying crystal tear upon her death, though by this time, Yura has passed on. Super cool character made all the more mysterious with his distinctive choice of headwear, which shields his facial features. And although he initially seems like a hard ass, I really like how his connection with Eleonora is handled, with them clearly having been friends, or perhaps more, back in the land of reeds before she lost herself. As great and tragic an ending as this may be though, this is not the last time you see Yura because at the beginning of the mountain tops of the giants, he appears once more, regardless of whether or not you've been following his questline, except the real Yura is dead, and his body is merely being used as a vessel by the most reviled man in history, Shabriri, who beseeches you to descend far down below Laindel to inherit the flame of frenzy. The flame of frenzy, your flesh will serve as kindling, and the girl can be spared, setting you on the righteous path of lordship, the path of the lord of chaos. Burn the earth tree to the ground and incinerate all that divides and distinguishes. Ah, oh, may chaos take the world. May chaos take the world. And there you have it folks, there is my list. It ended up being way longer than I thought it was going to be, but that's okay, there were a lot of really brilliant characters to talk about, and NPC questlines are not really something I've covered much on my channel. 
Like I said, I would have liked to do a best and worst NPCs, but I just couldn't figure out how. There are plenty of shitty enemies, bosses and levels in these games, but very few, if any, of the characters are actually shit. At some point, I will run out of ideas for these best and worst videos, but for now, I've still got a few ideas left in the tank, and so expect more videos in this series soon. Please allow me to give a final thank you to my splendid patrons for supporting the channel. And on that note, cheers for watching and cheerio.